Our next speaker will be Hank Paulson, accompanied by Mark Tursik, President and CEO of the Nature Conservancy. Mark is the author of the best-selling book, Nature's Fortune, How Business and Society Thrive by Investing in Nature, and a former managing director and partner at Goldman Sachs, where he spent 24 years. Mark brings deep business experience to his role leading the Conservancy, which he joined in 2008. I'll let Mark introduce further uh, Mr. Paulson, but please join me now in welcoming both of them to the stage. Thanks so much. I thought you said you were going to sit next to the lectern. You want me to? Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, it's great to be here, and it's my uh, honor, really, to introduce uh, Hank Paulson. Um, Hank's an extraordinarily distinguished person who's got so many accomplishments, so I'm going to use my notes to get this introduction right, Hank, okay? Henry M. Paulson, Jr. is a businessman, China expert, conservationist, and author. Hank served as the 74th Secretary of the Treasury under President George W. Bush. Prior to that, he had a 32-year career at Goldman Sachs, serving as Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, beginning in 1999. Earlier in his career, he was a member of the White House Domestic Council, as well as a staff assistant at the Pentagon. Today, Hank serves as chairman of the Paulson Institute at the University of Chicago. The Paulson Institute aims to advance sustainable economic growth, a cleaner environment, and cross-border investments in the United States and China. Hank is also the chairman of the Risky Business Project, Risky Business focuses on quantifying and publicizing the economic risks of climate change in the United States with former New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg and former hedge fund manager Tom Steyer. A lifelong conservationist, Hank was the chairman of the Nature Conservancy's board of directors, and prior to that, Hank founded and co-chaired TNC's Asia Pacific Council. In 2011, Hank founded and continues to co-chair the Latin American Conservation Council, which is comprised of global business and political leaders. Hank, thanks very much for being here. Uh, we have a lot to talk about, but before we get into the more wonky stuff, given everything you've accomplished um, over your career, I'd like to start at, at that. And, and can you just tell the audience a little bit about what, you, what you're able to do by bringing all these experiences together in your life? For example, why have you focused on environmental issues through, throughout your career? Uh, well, well, first of all, Mark, thank you, and thank you all. I'm, I'm delighted to be here today. From as far back as I can remember, I just was interested in nature and wild and beautiful places, and that went, morphed from a love of nature to wanting to help protect it, to work in conservation, and then as, time progressed, I became increasingly concerned about the, you know, the gigantic risk to the, our way of life posed by climate, uh, climate change and the risk to our global ecosystem and biodiversity. And, and so that just naturally led to, uh, to wanting to do more and more to protect it. And, um, and then after leaving government, that just really led to, to uh, my work in China where I thought I could have the biggest impact. But this is, it, it's a love, but I, I'd say my love is being in wilderness areas. That's what I love. I, I, I do the other out of just a great sense of responsibility and you know, a responsibility I feel to to future generations. It's a matter of generational equity to, to all, each of us work to, you know, to, to leave a healthy planet to, our, to those that come after us. Well, th thank you very much for being such a great champion of nature, Hank. You know, at TNC, um, one of our views is to make real progress in the environment. We have to bring government, business, conservationists and environmentalists, everyone really, bring people together to make more progress. You've been a leader in each of these sectors. What, what thoughts do you have on how society can do a better job of bringing you know, diverse parties, sometimes parties who don't get along with 
other, each other so well. How can we bring organizations, different parts of society together to make more environmental progress? Well, that's absolutely the key. I mean, that's where we work at the Paulson Institute is, is also, it takes government working with business, working with civil society, which are, you know, the, the environmental groups, the, the environmental NGOs. And I, I guess I say we, we can do a better job. We're, we're, I think those three groups are not working together to the extent they could and should be. Um, you know, I, I look at some of the work we're doing in conservation projects and we're winning a lot of battles and losing the war because of flawed government policies. And so it's, it's and I, I think in order to, and in many cases, businesses are well ahead of government and are really pretty enlightened to some of the very best companies in terms of what they're doing. But at least as I see it, when the CEOs of some of these global companies who are doing very good things in, in, in terms of their sustainability practice, when they spend time with the political leaders, they're not talking to them about climate change. Right. They're talking to them about whatever their, their issue of the day is, their, their commercial issue. And, and environmental groups uh, often uh, don't work as effectively as they, as they might with government. I mean, one of the things that, Mark, we've seen in working, as you know, in Latin America, is that there's gonna be a lot of infrastructure built, a lot of infrastructure. And, but environmentalists have never seen a dam they like, never seen an oil well they like, never seen a road they like, never seen a mine they like. But there are better roads and better dams and better oil wells, and just as we know what we know what the lead standard is for an energy efficient building, but there's very little incentive for government to work with environmental groups because they're going to oppose everything that's done, and as opposed to figuring out how to compromise. So as I think about that, I think the key really is to understand that economic growth and environmental protection shouldn't be at odds. They should be opposite sides of the same coin. You, we, nothing is going to be sustainable in terms of our economic prosperity unless we, uh, uh, unless we protect the environment and guard against some of these incredibly significant risks. And I think what history shows is unless uh, there is a certain amount of economic success, uh, the populations of a country don't focus on the environment, don't demand the actions by their government, and the government doesn't have the wherewithal to protect the environment. So I think the two go together and we can do a better job. Makes sense. You know, Hank, I know you're a fan of ARPA-E, and before we came out on the stage, we asked who's in the audience, and we were told, well, it's about one-third government people, about one-third academic scientists, and about one-third people from the private sector. So again, with the idea of we need different parts of society to work together more effectively, what, what, do you have any advice for this audience, how they can make a difference or ARPA-E can make well, an impact? Well, as I say, when I was here in Washington, I didn't see, there wasn't a lot of good news. I mean, things were either analytically complex, you know, like, well, well, there was very low, not a lot of low-hanging fruit. You know, as I, I thought about it, Social Security was was uh, analytically simple, but politically complex. Healthcare was analytically complex and politically complex. And if ever I wanted to feel good, I would come and spend some time, you know, with, with Sam Bodman and his people in those days and, and, and look at the good work that was being done with some of these technologies. And to step back a, a bit, I'm a Republican. I believe in market-based approaches. I'm not a believer in big national industrial policies like you know maybe a a, a Korea has or, or or so on, but research, basic research is critically important. I think we are way underinvested in it, way underinvested when you look at the the risks that 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 climate change poses and. I think you can expect business to do a fair amount with the proper incentives in terms of incremental innovation when you have the, the right incentives. But to get basic technologies to the point where they're commercially viable, it takes 
in investment in those technologies. You know, we heard Lamar Alexander talking about the internet. You know, that was, you know, that was, you know, DARPA, you know, and, and, uh, and uh, came out of the defense industry. You, you, you look at the space program and the moonshot. And, and, and so I just think this, this investment in, in basic research is critically important. And I take it a step further and say that it is, it is when you look at the job that needs to be done, it's very important to develop, to develop the kinds of funds that we need to support taking the research and then commercializing it and helping, uh, helping it get to the point that, that it, will, it can be rolled out in, in, in scale on a cost-effective basis. And so I'm, I'm a huge, uh, huge fan of, of RPE. Okay, let's um, let's turn our attention to China. Okay, so um, there's a lot of interest at this conference, and you and I have a lot of interest in energy, climate, the environment, and sustainability. How high a priority are these matters in China, and and are they really serious? The Chinese leaders about these topics. Oh yeah, you, you, you bet they are. If you, you we think about environmental challenges uh, and resource challenges in this country, they're much, much more acute in China. Um, the, uh, the top government leaders are really focused uh, on, on this, on, on meeting these challenges. I don't think the Communist Party will survive long term if they don't, if, if they don't deal with this. I mean, people, you know, are dying of, 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 of dirty air and, uh, you know, very focused on that, and there's there's a lot that the leaders are, are doing now. They've they've taken extraordinary steps over the last you know five years in terms of their investment in renewables and uh, and uh, some of their policies, but it's all been blown away by breakneck growth and uh, growth that's not sustainable. So the focus in China today is on you know a slower growth, higher quality growth, and, um, and, and, it's, a, and it's a big challenge, but there's, there's a lot of work that's being done. In that light, Hank, what do you make of the recent um, accord between China and the U.S. in connection with you know, carbon emissions and, and, and climate change? Uh, I, th I think it's historically very important, and let me just start by making a point, I imagine everybody here knows, but I'm just going to make it because it's that uh, that there's no chance of uh, of avoiding the huge economic and environmental climate risks, and you know some of the the worst cases if there's not real progress made in the developing world. And uh, when you look at China, which is the biggest emitter of carbon by far, and, uh, and that unless there's progress there and unless the U.S. and China can work together in a complementary way, there's, I think there's very little hope of making progress. And if, we do, if the two countries do work together, I think there's, there, there's, there's, there's some, some real Real hope, and you know, it's, it's it's a lot easier to be optimistic about meeting this this challenge. Number one. Uh, secondly, that I, I think that this this agreement is important, j just in terms of U.S.-China relations. That the fact that China is willing to make that joint announcement with the U.S. and work with the U.S. toward meeting this challenge, I think, signals how you know, serious their leaders are about finding, finding some, some areas of common interest where we can work together and get some things done. And then if you look at the agreement in and of itself, I think it is very, very important. Um, th this is the first time that China has been willing to make a statement like this. I've heard some of the detractors say, well, it's, it, it, it's, it, it's, it, it's not binding. Well, Paris is not gonna be binding, 
they're going to be nations taking unilateral, uh, making unilateral uh, pledges to work to meet a common goal. And, you know, the, the, the Chinese uh, don't make and have never been willing to make announcements and, uh, the, and put out goals that they are not committed to meet. And so you know they're going to be working hard to make their uh, to, to to make their goals, and you know I frankly am am optimistic that you'll see them really made binding as part of you know the domestic policy when you've got their their thirteenth and fourteenth five year plans. So again, I, I think this is very important, and I, I commend the Obama administration for 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 uh, working that through with the Chinese. No, I agree with you. I think it's actually very exciting. Um, here we have a lot of people focused on R&D and innovation. And Hank, in the past, I know you've said, boy, there ought to be a lot of opportunity between the U.S. and China. We can, we can make those R&D investments. They can be deployed at scale in China. But what's in the way? What do we need to do to facilitate that? How big a deal are things like intellectual property issues? What kind of market incentives do you think are needed to really accelerate this? Well, there's, Mark, there's a lot in that question. Because first of all, if you start by saying it is incredibly important that our two countries work together and no one can innovate like we do in the United States, no one has the national labs like we have here or the research universities or the, you know, the Silicon Valley or the, be able to, to innovate, the Chinese can roll out and test new technologies, particularly in the energy area and scale like no one else. So it's incredibly important. And if you take the position, which I think many of us take, that the climate risk is so huge, there is no excuse, no excuse for not using our very best technologies to, to meet the challenge. But intellectual property rights is a big issue in China. And the Chinese have come a ways uh, that as they've begun to innovate themselves and not just assimilate technology, you're seeing more and more concern, Chinese companies suing other Chinese companies over intellectual property. You're seeing courts that specialize in this area, but they've got far to go. They still got a ways to go. So we need some new thinking here. And I think that this you know, Clean Energy Research Center that right now where the U.S. government working with the Chinese government to invest in things like carbon capture and sequestration technology or energy storage, I think is a very interesting framework and I'm hoping there will be some breakthroughs here in terms of, uh, of you know, a model for how to own and uh, use these technologies. One of the things I'll be doing in mid-March with uh, Dan Poneman, who had been, you know, a, you know, a, a, an under uh, a deputy secretary here, and is now a, a distinguished fellow at the Paulson Institute, we'll have a conference in Beijing, where we're talking about funds, joint China-U.S. funds, to really roll out technologies because. Um, I think that some of these technologies that have already been proven to be commercially viable, but it, 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 they've got a ways to go until they can be shown to be, to, to be scalable on a cost-effective basis. China is a great place to, 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 to test those. And so I think there's, there's really room uh, to, to make some progress here. And I think that's get very important because it's going to take a lot of funding to do what we need to do. And we need to get both the government and the private sector involved. Okay. Now, um, you know, I'm an environmentalist, but I used to be an investment banker, so I like, I like market incentives. So when I, that all sounds very encouraging, but of course I can't help but think that would all be hugely accelerated if we had a price on carbon or these kinds of things. Right. Is there... But we've been talking about that, we environmentalists, for a long time. We don't have much to show for it. What's your outlook there? How important is it? Um, you know, what, what, what do you make of that? Well, I, I'm going to step back because I, I do think that 
it would make a significant difference. But it, it doesn't do away with the need to have more basic research. We are not, given the magnitude of this problem, we're not, there's not enough government research right now being, you know, devoted to this area. But put, put that aside. Okay. You know, I, I think you and I both know that if you want to change behavior, the, the quickest way to do it is with economic incentives. The quickest way to do it. And uh, because, first of all, energy efficiency is, is hugely important. The, the energy you don't use is the cleanest and the cheapest. And, you know, for instance, w w one of the real uh, opportunities in China is we don't need silver bullets or brand new technologies to make a lot of progress. If you just deployed existing technologies and practices, there's a lot to be done. If we're, you know, we're, we're, we're working on you know, building codes. That's another thing where Dan Poneman is working with us in energy efficient buildings because half of all new buildings going up in the world are in China and 40% of carbon emissions come from buildings. So there's just a, there, there are very big advantages. And I think in China, because they don't have the legal structure in place, they don't have a, a, a well-developed and effective regulatory system you know, like we do in the United States, it's very important that they put in place, which they're doing, performance evaluation systems for, for mayors and governors and, and put prices on carbon there and experiment with carbon taxes and so on. And again, I look forward to the day in the U.S. when we have, when, when, when we have a, a way to put a price on carbon and change behavior because it, it will, I think business will also innovate and you'll see a fair amount of innovation coming out of business. And I think that will be important and it'll be more, you know, g g making technologies uh, I incremental uh, uh, innovation, which can be very important in figuring out how to make some of the, 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 the newer technologies commercially viable. Okay, one, one more technology question. Carbon capture and storage technology, CCS. What do you think? Has that got a chance? Mark, I'm not, you're asking something that's, you know, that I, I, I'm not a scientist. All I can tell you is that, that any set of projections I've seen indicates that coal will be used longer than we all would like it to be. And so that's the holy grail. And right now, you know, our, you know, both the U.S. and China are investing in it through the, you know, through the, uh, you know, the, the Clean Energy Re Research Center. Um, it's one thing to have something that could be commercially viable, but it's another to, how can it be, can you develop that technology so it could be implemented in scale right. on a cost-effective basis in the developing world? And I think there's, there's a lot more that needs to be done there. And so that would be, uh, th that's the kind of thing I'm talking about in terms of we, do, we, we need more research. Yeah, I hope, I hope everybody in the audience who's on that beat will stay, stay engaged. Um, a final question about China, Hank. You've got a new book coming out in April called Dealing with China. Can you give us a preview? Well, it's, I don't think you want a preview. It's 145,000 words, but, <laughs> but, but, but it is, but it is, it's a book I'm excited about because what it does is it, it tells the story of working with uh, three sets of Chinese leaders, beginning with Zhu Ranji and, and Zhang Zemin, right up today with to, to Xi Jinping, working with them over 20 years uh, as they've made the decisions that have led to China's economic rise. and. Um, and there's a, so there's a big focus on, you know, the, China's economic development, but there's a, a, a big focus on the, the, the environmental issues and, and, and conservation issues. And, uh, and the, the, the thesis behind the book is very simply that this is a very important relationship. It's, it's, it's our most important bilateral relationship. 
uh, if we get this right, it's going to be much easier to deal with a whole range of global challenges that are economic, environmental challenges, nuclear proliferation, terrorism. And if we don't, some of them are going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to solve. And that this is an, going to be an increasingly complex and difficult relationship. So we need to find uh, common ground. And having common ground is not enough. You need to turn that common you know, interest, complementary interest, into tangible results where we work together. That's an, one of the reasons why I see that climate change uh, announcement as being, as being very important. But this is a story, it's a very much of an inside story, a lot of, a lot of anecdotes. It's, uh, so it will, you know, it's, it's one that I've worked on for several years and, and I won't work on another one, I guarantee you that. It's, it's, it's a long process. Well, I look forward to, to reading it, Hank. Uh, let's, let's talk about the U.S. a little bit, and in particular, the Risky Business Project, which, which you co-chair. And I don't know if everyone knows about this project. Again, as an environmentalist, I find it so exciting. Uh, focused on uh, helping the business community and mainstream America better understand the risks from climate in a fact-based, nonpartisan way. How's, how's that going? Tell us about the effort. Well. Uh, first of all, you're, you're nice to comment the way you, you did. I, when I left government, you know, it, what I had assumed well, we, I'd, I'd worked on helping, you know, set up the clean technology funds at the IFC and set up an environmental department at Treasury, but I didn't intend to work on climate in this country. I just thought I could make the biggest difference doing things in China. And when I was approached by Mike Bloomberg, and I really love the idea of working, you know, this is with Mike and with, with Tom co-chairing it, but this is bipartisan. So we have, you know, Bob Rubin is a, you know, on the risk committee, he's a, you know, obviously a Democratic uh, Treasury Secretary. George Schultz, who was Secretary of Everything, but as a Republican is, <clears throat> is involved, we have, business leaders like Greg Page, we have, so we, it, it's bipartisan. And the important thing that this does is rather than dealing with the language of science or the environment, it's on economics. So it's in a language that business understands and it looks at uh, by geography. So we can go right down to the county level and is say under various uh, scenarios laid out by the scientific community, we, we will look at the economic impact. And so for the first time you're looking at the cost of doing nothing. What is the cost of not acting? And you go from, you know, the, uh, you know, you know, high, low probability, high, higher risk scenarios to the, to, to, the, to the more likely scenarios, it's it's all open source, and it's I think been very well received because one of the things I find is that when we're sitting down, uh, and regardless of where the community is, when we're sitting down with with, with local business people or with civic leaders, and we're not talking about what the solution is, we're just saying, let's look at the risks and let's look at the impact on this, this, this city or this state. It really gets people's attention. And the, the results are breathtaking in, in a number of places. You know, I grew up on a farm in Illinois and, and there are a lot of scenarios where, you know, Illinois won't be growing a lot of corn or Iowa won't be growing a lot of corn. The production will be going north because what was a, a temperate zone is, 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 is going to become arid and you're looking at, at, at whole growing seasons and weather patterns changing. And you, you look at areas like the, you know, the, the, the southeast and what you see in terms of, of, of risks with, you know, really unbearably hot uh, days or, 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 or sea rise are, are, are pretty, pretty. Uh, it, it gets your attention. So, so what we're finding, and one of the things we're attempting to do with this, 
is we're, we're, we're wanting to get the attention of the business community. And we really want them to do three things. We want them to look at climate risk like any other business risk and incorporate it in their decision-making process. And uh, number one. Number two, we want them to make disclosures. There's no reason not to make disclosures of these risks. And uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to see the SEC and the investment community and so on really you know, insist on disclosures. And, and, and then the third thing, we, we'd like the business community when they're talking to their government leaders to, to, to encourage them to act. So in any event, what we find is, I, I found very little criticism people that are, from people that are ostensibly climate deniers to those that are zealots. They, as a matter of fact, the, the criticism we tend to get come more from the people that are the most concerned because they'd like to see us go further and make stronger recommendations. But when you're just talking about what is happening now, no one is denying what they see in terms of uh, changing weather patterns and and they're very, very interested in, 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 you know, in, in having a conversation that starts in the middle. Well, again, thanks. I really admire that effort to, to reach out respectfully to people who might not even necessarily agree with you going in and, and try to find common ground. I think all of, and the environmental community can learn from that. Hank, you've also been very generous to work with the Nature Conservancy in founding and co-chairing the Latin American Conservation Council. You won't all know about that, but Hank and some others recruited uh, an extraordinary group of business and political leaders across Latin America and North America to focus in a practical way on the kinds of conservation issues our organization cares about. Again, it's great outreach to folks who might not necessarily think of themselves at first as our allies. How's that going in, in your view? In, in many ways, it's going well. Just, just to back up a bit, I, I think when I think of climate and the risks to our planet, I don't think just in terms of clean energy and new technologies. I think about our ecosystem because I think it's, you know, I, I think we're near a tipping point. And so two areas that I focus on are China, for the obvious reasons I've gone through, and then Latin America because it is so rich in natural resources and in water and in forests and so on and there's going to be a big development phase and a lot of infrastructure built there, and it's important to not make the kinds of mistakes we've made. And so the focus is on three areas, water security, again, nature-based solutions to save the watershed, getting businesses to, 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 to invest, recognizing that green infra infrastructure, you know, it, or green capital may, may be it may be a better investment than investing in gray infrastructure because the forests you know ge, you know ge, generate and clean the water and and so there's a big focus on um, on food security so how do you double food production without destroying again the valuable parts of the ecosystem and smart infrastructure how do you build the infrastructure and minimize the damage. And I would say what I, my, my takeaway is this. On the one hand, we've got a great group of companies that are, that are members, 35 you know, or so Latin American CEOs from, from major companies in Latin America and, 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 and uh, eight or nine different uh, countries. And we have you know, big U.S. companies like Cargill and Bungie and IBM and, and Dow and so we have we have a, a a terrific group and we have some successful projects but I think we're winning a lot of battles we have 23 water funds but we're losing the war because you realize that the root cause of so much of these are flawed government policies mm. you know that the and whether they're in the ag area or whether they are in terms of not having the right protections against illegal mining and the mercury poisoning or cutting the forest. And so I think we need to do a better job of advocacy with government leaders. And so, you know, the Paulson Institute in China, we focus on research, projects, and advocacy. 
And I think we're doing some really good job. We're making real progress in the Latin American Conservation Council where we've advocated in certain areas, you know, you know, the two or three countries and so on. So this is a big, important initiative. I'm, I, I, I'm enthusiastic about it. We're making progress, but I feel a sense of urgency. Yeah. Okay, well, regrettably, we're running out of time. So one last question, Hank. Um, I know you're a grandparent, a proud grandparent. You've thought hard about all these issues. When you think about the world we're leaving to our grandchildren, um, are you an optimist? Well, listen, Mark, you and I, we wouldn't be doing what we were doing if we're not optimists, right? If you, were, if you weren't optimists, you'd just go, you know, shrink and, and, and do nothing. But so I am a optimist to, in the extent that, to the extent that I believe that there's a lot. We, today we have the science, we have the knowledge, we have a lot of the technologies we need to deal with these problems. We're the first generation that that really is is got that and and has got the ability to really do something. I I can't say I'm an optimist in terms of what I see happening. In, in many areas. In other words, there's a lot of progress, but we're, I, I think we're losing the battle. But you and I have worked on enough things that were difficult. You know, what's, you know, the, the what, what, what I think life is all about and happiness is all about is working to achieve something that's very difficult and, 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 and making progress. And, you know, we've got to be optimists because I think the biggest enemy we have in dealing with climate or any of the environmental issues are a sense of resignation. Hmm. A sense of, uh, of, I don't think it's as much selfishness, you know, as I, I look at these issues, we deal best when things are short term, more immediate, as opposed to long term, and we deal best when we're dealing with them at the national level as opposed to the global issue. And these are long term, difficult, global issues. But, um, and so they're difficult issues, but I am convinced, when, particularly when I see young people everywhere, the young people, I'm convinced we're somehow going to figure out how to, uh, how to solve this, but we sure can't let up. Okay, well Hank, thank you for everything you do. Thanks everyone for listening to us. Thank Good afternoon. You. Thank you. Thanks Mark, thank you all. Thank you again. Thanks, Hank, so much for joining us. Thanks, Mark, for leading the conversation. That's